Um, just be careful with hitting the table oh. next to the mic. Yeah. Yes, I'm. I'm sorry. I'm a very. I, I'm. A, I'm an East European Italian. <laughs> right from New York. So from New hands, York. The hands come naturally. That's right. Too. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> no worries at all. My husband's always moving my coffee cup. Because <laughs> oh, you're gonna not right. <laughs> was born a long time ago. We don't have to mention that, right? I'll cut it up. Oh, good. <laughs> well, it's okay. I'm a woman of a certain age. What can I say? All right. I was born in New York. I grew up in this neighborhood of Chesky people, Czechoslovakian people in New York City. Immigrants, my mother's first generation. Um, on both sides, it was first generation. So I'm, I'm an immigrant. So in fact, coming to Canada is perfect. <laughs> it, it, it's the profile, right? And uh, my parents moved to Vermont when I was nine. You know, they were hardworking, crazy people who, when everybody else in New York City was moving up to New York State, like to Larchmont or, one, or Mount Vernon or the, the upper class kind of middle class, and buying everybody else's the same kind of furniture and the same cars and the same houses. My mom and dad got in a, a wooden station wagon that had terrible fumes, exhaust fumes that were coming through the floorboards. And they went to Vermont, to Guilford, Vermont, because this old lady promised my father land, 400 acres, if he would just go there and take care of the property. And so they went. And that's the kind of family I come from. <laughs> And I grew up very isolated in Vermont. I went to a one-room schoolhouse. It was so traumatic, I couldn't read. I started stuttering. I was just, it was a shock. When I was seven in the Bronx, New York, my Aunt Marion used to draw these kind of uh, fashiony girls with their heads on their shoulder and girly, girly girls, I used to call them. And she had a blackboard behind a door in her living room. And my cousin Judy and I were three months apart, so we were kind of like twins. And we grew up playing together and all that stuff. And my aunt said, girls, I'm going to give you a test. And I said, okay, and Judy said, okay, I want you each to draw one of my girls that I draw. So I proceeded to draw one. And it looked just like my Aunt Marion's. My Aunt Marion said, Mimi, that's what I was called then. I wasn't Maggie Schmidt. That's my nom de plume. Mimi, you're an artist. I said, oh, okay. And that's it. That's when I became an artist. When I was nine and my parents moved to Vermont, there was an outbuilding, a little cabin. And my father and mother set it up as a studio for me with an easel and paints and canvases and charcoal paper. And I just, I was an artist. I remember the first artist I absolutely adored was Dura, with his praying hands. I discovered drawing and painting, and that was very important. And in fact, in a dysfunctional family, it saved my life. That and reading made me who I am. And I, I, so uh, my being an artist is my life. It's who I am. I don't know anything else. I went to art school and had magnificent teachers, teachers that people should all have. They were, they were from Europe. They were the people, they were the immigrants who came from the war. And so they're, they're famous. You look at Richard Lindner, beautiful German Jew. He was my figure teacher and he was my teacher for a class called Creative Expression. He was brilliant. He made you see. He made you feel. There was a teacher at Pratt who uh, wore red socks, and his name was Duncalf. And he said to the class, he said, I want you all to paint Duncalf's red socks. This is creative, how do you do this? I don't even remember what I did, but I know it was that kind of thing where you, he would twist your mind into really thinking outside the barriers of what is expected. Uh, a formal education, in fact, is an asset. 
but it isn't the end all and be all. And then let's take Nelson Surrett, who was not trained formally. He was an upholsterer, but he had that which makes up an artist. And we could talk about that which makes up an artist because that which makes up an artist is very, very special. People do not appreciate art history. They, 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 they think art is from a vac in a vacuum. Everything that came before, the cavemen and their marvelous drawings, all of that that came before comes to us. And there's this magnificent historical connection you cannot underestimate. So if you haven't ever studied art history, and you're just painting, a Sunday painter kind of thing, and you develop a form and the form becomes popular or whatever, that's all well and good. But unless you have the richness of what went before, you're kind of missing something. Unfortunately, in art history, there have not been very many women. Kathy Kolowitz, my, famous, my favorite female artist. She was German during World War II. She, powerful. She, she was a, a printmaker and her drawings, in one mark, she draws the line that describes the arm that's sticking out here. Exquisite. And that take, that's like a child. When you look at a child drawing a painting and they make a mark, it's got power. It's like, whoomp. And that's what makes great art, is that power, that, that immediacy, that, that absolute wholeness of movement between you and the visual experience and the material. And that's that you feel when you go into a museum. Okay, my mom and dad came to Nova Scotia uh, in 1970. My brother had gone on a, an adventure. He went into Nova Scotia. He told my mother and father about how beautiful Nova Scotia was. They decided they would go up, check it all out, and they moved here. So Roy and I had gotten together that year, but we decided we would visit my mom and dad in Nova Scotia and just say hi and just sort of figure out what the next step was in our getting together. We drove down to my mom's in Salmon River, and we decided this is where we want to be. That was that. Just, just like we decided we want to be together. It was the same kind of thing, bang, bang. Didn't, uh, didn't think twice. We lived in Woodvale. Woodvale's a special little village area, just tiny, 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 but it's all French, and it's right after Port Maitland. And the people treated us like family. They were just so kind, all of them. And we became part of, as they say in Yiddish, the Mishpaka. We were the Garup. And they, oh, they did wonderful things for us. And so that was my introduction to Acadians in Nova Scotia. And I swore I didn't want to live anywhere except in Acadie. Uh, I, I think that in terms of communities of artists, I'm a loner. I think a lot of artists are. When I arrived, Alex Jigaroff and Hugh Eamon and Helen Weld and Lucy Jarvis were the acts in town. And Alex Jigaroff and Hugh Eamon used to like to go on the main street and paint, and that was just not my style. I'm private, so I never really I mean, we hardly connected. But Lucy Jarvis and Helen were a different kettle of fish. We just embraced them as, as artists, as people, because they talked the same language. Although Lucy was very hard to talk to because you couldn't say things like psychology or psychological. She, that was not a word in her vocabulary and she would get irate. So you had to be very careful about how you talked to her. But she was a wonderful painter. We used to show at the sign of the whale, Michael and Franz. That was, so we got to know people, and uh, we became good friends with Brian Porter and uh, Cecil Day. I, I, when I was younger, I, I could have been a party girl kind of thing, but I, I, 
I like it quiet. We have a few good friends, that's enough. Do you, do you feel anxious at all when you see particularly other artists looking at your work? No. 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 I know who I am. <laughs> I I, 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 I I know when I do something that's crummy. What do you do when you've done something that's crummy? Probably either destroy it, tear it up, or make or work on it again and make it better. I mean, I don't know, just whatever. <laughs> I got one behind you that I the, the the irises are great, but the building doesn't work, and I don't know what to do with it. And I feel like, ugh. anyhow, but that's beside. It feels like it's out of a storybook, and it makes me sick. <laughs> It should have looked more like this. That's Wolf Khan. He's, I don't know if he's dead yet. He was very, very old. He lives in Vermont and a lovely, lovely painter. He's sort of like a, a foggy impressionist. Isn't that gorgeous? It's so little information, there's so much. I've always painted figuratively and abstractly at the same time, always because they feed each other. The abstract work gives you the gesture, the movement, the comfort with destroying and rebuilding and, 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 and expression. But I also love the figure. I love the, the, the thing. But I love the thing in a way that I become part of the thing, not that I am trying to copy it or whatever. So I love looking and seeing and, and feeling and feeling the movement of a petal, uh, the, the softness of a, a tree, even just, you know, the, the, the looking out and all of a sudden seeing patches and forms that are geometric, because that's how you see. And what an artist does is he breaks up seeing into all these different things. And, um, I like seeing. Um, I can't think of anything more to ask in particular. Good. Do you have anything? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>